Good, we recognized it. <laughs> I hope we would. Well, you never know. <laughs> Some people are from cities <laughs> and don't look at plants. <laughs> Maybe. Well, the purpose of drawing these uh, is not for our drawings to be super, super beautiful. It's so that you practice noticing some things now so that lecture is a little less boring and you can confirm whether you see some of these traits that we're going through in your drawing. So pay a little bit of attention to traits about the leaves, anything you can see about the stem, um, so that you can play a scavenger hunt as we talk today. Or make a very beautiful drawing. <laughs> While you guys are drawing, who didn't get wooden boards at the end of last week? I've made some over the weekend. I've never made anything out of wood before, but uh, worked out okay. You're drawing the corn plant. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> and it saw. I felt very intense. <laughs> like, you know, like, <laughs> like <laughs> Yeah. 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 Yeah, so I wanted to show the holes away. I'll put them there. Maybe some people will Basically, that was one. That's what I Okay. As they're talking, I'm also going to start some other plants from opposite ends of the room. So I don't have to draw them, but take a look. We're looking at the bigger ones here. We're going to be carrying them a little bit to the corn and they're going to pass some of the water. This plant I picked up off the ground in Florida and I'm in my shower. They're 100%. Mm -hmm. Okay, so hopefully we recognize the corn or heard people say corn. Our group today that we're gonna be talking about are the monocots. Um, so we're beginning going into the two main groups of angiosperms of flowering plants, the monocots and the dicots, or the eudicots now, so that we can have one monophyletic group. So last time we talked about our basal angiosperms and the magnolias are kind of Outgroups are weirder groups here. And for the rest of the course, we're doing monocots today and this week, and then we'll be in dicots for 
the rest of our time. So our monocrops do have economic importance. They make up a bunch of staple foods, specifically grains. So a lot of your diet is made up of corn, corn syrup, corn meal, all sorts of things, right? Other monocots would include things like wheat, things like rice are going to be in the same group. So they are important. Other monocots uh, can be fruits like pineapple, bananas, uh, also roots, yams, flowers, tulips, orchids. We'll take a look at several examples. That said, as I was poking around in the greenhouse today, uh, corn is very important. It's something you would plant, but most of the plants that we plant from seed tend to be dicots. Um, so corn, really important, but lots of things you might be starting for the spring will be dicots. Okay. In terms of our history of systematics. People have recognized for a long time that monocots and dicots are different. Uh, they're pretty easy to tell apart just with your eyes, just looking at the sprouts. Uh, so this terminology of monocots and dicots first appeared in taxonomic studies back to like the 1600s. So here we have an old semi-phylogeny, right, a chart trying to group together our plants. And we can see that the monocots do kind of appear in here. Okay. So the way you tell you're looking at a monocot, if you are looking at a tiny little seedling, so we have cotyledons, which are embryonic leaves inside our seeds. And monocots have one, dicots have two. That's where the terms come from. The cot is for the cotyledon, mono versus die, just one and two. So the first thing to appear above the soil is really gonna tell you what you're looking at. So we can see a monocot here, probably a little corn, who knows? And here we see a dicot on the other side. We would be able to see these structures forming within the seed. So when we did our fruit lab, we cut open the corn, we looked for the endosperm and some of that uh, growing plant embryo inside, which would include the cotyledon starting to come out. A note about when you're growing things from seed, true leaves, like the adult mature leaves of a plant, will often look different than the cotyledons, these first seed leaves that come out. Uh, so you shouldn't be surprised when you plant like a little tomato seed. It's going to have really simple cotyledons coming out. It happens to be a dicot, but then the structure of the mature leaves that grow afterwards have a lot of different shape, a lot of different features. Um, that you don't see in these first cotyledons coming out. Okay. So we are not always going to have just our tiny little seedling, right? You don't have a tiny little seedling in front of you right now as more than one leaf, more than one, well, had a cotyledon, now it has actual leaves. Uh, so we're going to think about how we might recognize a fully mature monocot. So we're going to start with some leaf. So our monocots are going to be mostly herbaceous, so we're not really going to see wood, really no true wood, however, monocots, depending exactly how you want to define wood. Our leaves are often going to be oblong, linear, lanceolate, so kind of long and stretched out, and their veins are very often going to be parallel. So. Who drew some veins on the picture? All right, you draw them in parallel? Cool, perfect. So if you did that, you would notice that you're looking at a monocot. So that won't be true for all of our monocots, but if you see parallel veins, it's a pretty diagnostic characteristic that if you see them, you have a monocot. Another thing that we're going to notice about our monocot is at the nodes. So where the leaves are coming out, those leaves are gonna to cling to the stem in kind of a sheath. So who drew how the corn leaves are attaching to the stem? Hopefully everybody, right? So you can see that how it's kind of holding fingers around the stem, holding onto it. That's different than when we were looking at our leaf shapes, our structure of the twig, thinking about where those leaves would come out. Right? In our dicots, and our twigs are dicots because they are woody, they had woody structures. Right, we had a petiole, we maybe had a little 
axillary bud here. We had a leaf coming out with a little stalk, that petiole. So that's a really different structure. It's kind of separate. You can imagine it breaking off, snapping off that twig. When you're looking at a monocot, in general, that's going to look kind of harder to break off. You're going to be thinking like, oh, I have to kind of peel this. That's a, another indication that you may be looking at a monocot. If you were to cut the stem open, which we are not going to cut these corn plants in half today, uh, you would notice that the structure inside the stem, as well as in the root, is going to be different between a monocot and a dicot. So a monocot stem looks like it has kind of random scattered vascular bundle. So when we looked at trees and we looked at wood, we saw that we had distinct rings, right, in our gymnosperms and then also our other wood examples in the wood lab when we were counting growth rings. Okay. So those were the angiosperms in there were examples of dicots versus the monocots. We got this kind of scattered stuff. So this is a histological slide. And then we can see uh, just a picture of someone slicing open a stem here. So it's going to be some sort of complex, unordered looking tissue instead of these stripes of xylem and phloem. And actually, many monocot stems, especially in specific families, are going to be hollow, so just an empty kind of middle. If we look at the roots, we will see some shapes, so some more kind of identifiable structure. Specifically, if we slice open a root of a monocot, we're going to expect to see kind of like a circle here versus in a dicot. You see that looks kind of scattered, but you can see in the middle, you see a characteristic dicot shape, which is this kind of star thing in the center of the root. Okay. However, again, we're probably not going to be slicing open too many roots, but we might be able to see some roots. So when we're looking at a root just with our eyes, the larger structure of that root, that sort of gross morphology, what we can actually see, and monocots is going to tend to be more fibrous. So we're going to see just kind of roots branching out all over the place. Whereas when we look at dicot roots, we're often going to see like a single tap root going down and then maybe secondary branches off of that, but more of a kind of tree-like structure underground versus the monocots, we got squiggly little roots all over the place. So those Examples that I'm passing around uh, are epiphytes, so they don't need to grow in dirt, air plants. So you should be able to take a look at some of those roots on those as well. To see that sort of monocot root branching pattern or lack thereof. So a note, monocots don't in general really form trees. Uh, palm trees are, however, an example of monocot plants. Uh, so you can look here at the trunk of a palm sliced open versus a normal tree trunk here. So in the normal tree trunk, you see these rings forming, those annual growth rings. In the palm trunk, we just kind of got this uniform mass here. Okay, so some people, if they're being kind of pedantic, might argue that a palm tree is not a tree. Um, we call them palm trees, so they might as well be trees. There's not really a very specific definition of actually what a tree is or if there is, it kind of varies from person to person. Okay, so the big tree trunk, quote unquote, of palms and larger monocots uh, is often going to form by having overlapping kind of leaves that create part of this supporting structure. So you can see that in some of our palm tree examples. And then we see all the leaves at the crown here. What you're looking at, this example is actually roots. This is one of my favorite trees, not trees as the case may be. So I pulled it on here. This is a walking palm. I like it particularly because they're said to walk across the forest floor, which they actually do. Um, they grow roots specifically to a side towards light and they kill off the roots on the opposite side. So it's a very slow walk, but they can move towards gaps in the forest. Uh, and get more light for themselves, which I think is crazy. Love a time lapse of that. If we're lucky to, enough to have a monocot in front of us that has a flower, uh, we would be able to tell that we have a monocot by counting the petals. 
So monocots are going to have their parts in three. So that should be true for both the petals and any sepals that we have. So we can see this yellow flower has one, two, three petals, one, two, three sepals. So if you count up all those structures you see, you should be able to tell if you have a monocot. For dicots, we don't have a specific number we're looking for, uh, multiples of maybe four or five. Uh, we would also be able to tell whether we have a monocot or a dicot looking at the pollen. And this can be used in like archaeology or in the fossil record or something if we're looking for evidence of monocots and dicots, but we don't have the whole plant itself. Uh, I spent a while working on a research project where they were scraping off the insides of ancient jugs to try and find pollen to tell what people were eating. So you can tell monocot and dicot pollen apart based on the number of grain openings. So monocots tend to have just like one little opening in their pollen grain and dicots have like three openings. You can actually identify plants in detail often based on the shape and structures in their pollen. So I've included a bunch of flower examples since I don't have any flowers to bring you today. Uh, but we're just counting, right? So here we can see one, two, three petals, one, two, three sepals, telling us this is a monocot. We can actually see that those um, reproductive structures in the center of the flower are also in groups of three here. We can see three lobes with a stigma here, and then we can see three stamens here and three more for six when we're looking at the male part of the androids. I gave you lots of examples. So another set of three petals here, telling us we're looking at a monocot. And another one, one, two, three, one, two, three. And then some examples with sets of three, three, right? So it doesn't have to be just three. So here we have one, two, three, four, five, six with these lilies. Also examples of monocots. Or some crocuses, gotta look carefully. We have six here as well. And our daffodils. Again, we have a set of three here and a set of three there. So if you are quizzing yourself, making yourself little monocot dicot flashcards as you study for a practical or something, there are some examples you could use. A couple of weirder things. So when we were doing our flower lab, we did look at a dissection of an orchid. So we do have some specialization in specific groups of monocots and in specific species. Uh, so we saw that we had three sepals that looked like petals behind here in our orchid. And then we had another group of three, actually technically petals in the center, but we had one that was really specialized. So the labellum looking kind of like a lip here, making up that third part of the set. So sometimes we'll need to look a little bit closer to figure out what actually is a petal in our flower. Or we might have a compound flower where we have a bunch of little florets in an inflorescence. So this is an example of a giant onion flower. So you'd have to look closely into this ball to see that we have one, two, three, one, two, three petals on each tiny little flower. If you got a flower, this is a pretty good rule to use for finding our monocots. So we have some ideas about monocot evolution. Uh, our oldest fossils are from maybe 120 million years ago. DNA evidence places the evolution of monocots much earlier. Um, a number I found was 135 plus. I wouldn't be shocked if they placed it even farther back now. And one theory that some people have that I think is really fun, so I'm going to tell you about it, is that monocots may have evolved from an aquatic ancestor. So we see a monocot growing in water here. Okay. And we have some arguments for why that might be true. So whether it is true or not, this can help us kind of remember our monocot traits and think about them and think why they would look like this. So some aquatic examples that we looked at in our last lab, we looked at the Nymphaeales group, the water lilies. 
right? So we did look at the fact that we can have net-like branching veins to create strength in water-dwelling plants. Um, but if we think about what would happen with a parallel vein, they would be a lot less stiff. But if we don't have to carry anything and if we're just floating on the top of the water, depending on the function of that leaf, that might not be so much of a problem that you have floppy leaves. It may help spread out kind of over the surface in a sort of flatter manner in order to prove, to give space for photosynthesis. Another trait of the monocots, right, is that they have no petiole and they're just grasping onto the stem in this kind of sheet. So an idea could be that this helps them hold on in water as that water current is kind of moving. If you had just a little stick attached to the stem, maybe that would break off in a current. The stem is herbaceous instead of woody in monocot. So maybe they didn't need much support because they didn't need to fight gravity in the same way underwater. And it provides some flexibility to bend with waves. Uh, and it is actually true that wood would potentially interfere with how we carry oxygen to underwater parts. So just a quick note about roots. Uh, you might be surprised to know that plants actually do have to breathe oxygen through their roots. Usually we think about plants as producing oxygen because they do as a byproduct of photosynthesis, but they do also need energy in the form of ATP to do all sorts of cellular processes. So their underground parts will soak up oxygen in part here to do those processes. Um, so there's kind of a give and take. It's just on balance, they're net producers of oxygen. It doesn't mean they never breathe oxygen in. Okay. So I like these arguments, regardless of whether they are true or not, because they're definitely fun and someone published them. So there's some evidence and some peer review there as well, not just pure guessing. Okay. So we're going to walk through some groups of monocots. So our monocots are a monophyletic group. So it means we have a common ancestor and we're looking at all the descendants of that common ancestor. So in our last lecture on the basal angiosperms and the magnolias, we looked at this figure on the left here. So you can see the green triangle is just all our monocots. I pulled out a bunch of families, so a sort of full phylogeny just of monocots over here on the right. Uh, so if you want to look through those for your curiosity to think about what more things are monocots, you can look here, or if you want to practice thinking about phylogenies, this can be an example, which who knows, maybe I will pull from to ask you specific questions in the future. Here is another example, phylogeny. Okay. We're gonna pick a, a little phylogeny to kind of pull out our main groups. We're not gonna go through that whole big map today. Okay. So we're gonna be looking at the camelinids and especially this group, koale. We're gonna be looking at the liliale, so the lilies. And we're gonna be looking at some of these more basal branches the Acoralis and the Lismitalis, because they look a little different. Okay. We're going to start at the bottom with our outgroup, but still within our monocots. So our Acoralis, we're going to see are the sister group to all the other monocots. They're branching off first. And their inflorescence looks a little weird. Um, so if you see this structure, this is called a spadix. So this looks kind of like uh, those spikes we saw in our piper alley when we were looking at our basal angiosperms and magnolias last time. So a similar kind of structure here in a spike in fluorescence. So we have lots of little um, florets sort of within it. So small flowers around a long fleshy stem is a stadium. But you'd only expect to see kind of like one here, whereas when we were looking at the Piper Alex, we saw many and it wasn't quite so fat and like kind of juicy looking, I would say. Some of some of identifying plants is about like gut feel. So <laughs> when I use words like that, that's what I'm trying to 
get me across to you. Okay. So walking in, we're next going to think about the Elis metallic. So this is an order of plants that's either tropical or aquatic, so it includes both kinds. Uh, a bunch of cool house plants are in this group, but also little boring pond weeds are in this group. Uh, one common one you may find is the water plantain pictured here. So to tell these apart from Nymphaealis, which we saw last week, those water lilies, we're going to notice that if we have a flower, it looks super different. When we look at water lilies, we have uh, those whirls of petals, that structure. When we look at a, um, I don't know, uh, a water plantain, for example, we're going to see that we just have these little flowers with three sepals and often three petals, telling us it's a monocot, uh, often in an inflorescence rather than just a single flower kind of sitting on the water. And if we look at the veins on those leaves, we can see that they're parallel rather than a sort of net like pinnate or palmate, as the case may be in our net Okay. A cool houseplant group. Uh, in this family are the aeroids or the family Araceae. So lots and lots of houseplants fall within this group because they have all sorts of decorative leaves and flowers. So we can see some of the uh, different types of leaves we see just within this single family. So those leaves will have weird lobes, weird kind of holes, potentially variegation is when we have different colors within a leaf. We'll see a lot of aeroids with variegation. Um, and we can see here a little bit more of a flower structure. So again, like the acaralis, we have a spadix, so this kind of spike thing. We also have a single structure that's going to look like a petal. There's only one of it. That's OK, even though we're a monocot, because it is technically not a petal. We're getting into technicalities here right? as botanists. Uh, but technically, this is just a modified leaf that's surrounding the spadix, which is more of our flower structure here for the aeroid. So we're thinking like kind of like calla lilies here. There are other examples that you might see outside, uh, like skunk cabbage, which is actually thermogenic, so it makes its like own heat. Um, often they're going to contain calcium oxalate crystals, which are mildly toxic, not super toxic, but mildly toxic. So if you're looking for plants to forage out in the wild, this is not necessarily your best bet. Which I say because when I was stuck in quarantine, I saw all the skunk cabbage come up first. It's very beautiful, but bright green. It looks like cabbage or beautiful lettuce. You want to eat it, you should not. No, so, you know, maybe you wouldn't want to eat it as much as I would. So here we can see some examples of some houseplants that you might have at home or your friends might have uh, within this group. I'll bring some in in the future from my house. Okay, so now we're going to jump into our lilies. So this is an order of lilies. Uh, we often group it with the asparagalis, so like the word asparagus um, together, and we will talk about a specific example within those our orchids. True lilies are going to grow from bulbs or corms, so those swollen structures kind of at the base of a stem. Uh, we can have perennial herbs and vines here, so they're herbaceous, they die back, right? They have green, flexible stems, but that doesn't mean they're dead, dead forever. They often have very pretty flowers, so in groups of three, we can count pretty well when we're looking at our lily alex. Lots of cool color. Uh, sometimes they'll have sort of strap-like leaves with parallel veins. Uh, occasionally we will see leaves that are trying to trick us. So they may be more ovate, maybe with a little bit of netting. So when you're identifying monocots, you want to think about all of these characteristics and sort of count them up as a group. I'm not going to tell you to do like actual counting or math. I don't have an equation for you. But if you see like two or three of the characteristics that we're looking for, but some other things are different, you should still be suspicious that you may have a monocot. This is not all of these traits need to be hard and fast rules. We can have separate lines of evolution in each of our groups and in each of our species. Okay. So this is not just flowers that we call lilies in English. 
for example, our tulips go here in our lily eyes. So we're going to step up to the asparagale, uh, which are grouped in with those lilies. So if we say lilioids, we might be excluding these. Uh, so orchids are in the family Orchidaceae in the order asparagale. They're one of the largest families of flowering plants. So we have lots and lots of different species in our orchids, including vanilla, which is actually the seed pod of an orchid. So we think of it as plain and boring when we eat it as a flavor in ice cream, but actually it's crazy and amazing that we have it and it's so common. When we look at orchids, their flowers look more complicated. So I picked out a typical example earlier in those flower example slides, um, but they get even weirder. Uh, we are gonna expect to see bilateral symmetry in our orchids rather than radial symmetry. Uh, so those specializations are gonna be usually on both sides. We'll be able to draw just like one line of reflection. And we can see that they often have a modified petal called a labellum. And they're going to be characterized by having fused stamens and carpels kind of together in a column, which you may or may not remember from that orchid dissection before. Here are some cool examples of orchids. Um, I like flowers that look like other flowers and there are lots, or sorry, flowers that look like other things. And there are lots of cool examples within the orchid. Uh, I think my favorite might be the flying duck orchid, which I love it so much. Um, we also have a dove orchid, a bumblebee orchid, and a naked man orchid. There are tons and tons of very weird looking orchids. They're very exciting, not just uh, that one standard one that you always get from the grocery store, or, you know, furniture stores or wherever those orchids are. If anybody ever sees someone selling a flying duck orchid, let me know. I really, really want to get one. <laughs> I don't know that they grow well in houses. Uh, so those characteristics that we're looking at, right, we're looking for three petals, three sepals, and what's kind of uniting these all, because they don't all just look like this sort of stereotypical orchid, is that we have fused together in a column, the female reproductive parts, so like the stigma and the ovary, and those male reproductive parts. So here we can see the anther, which in an orchid kind of turns into just like a little anther cap. And the pollen is contained in two little balls right below it. So those are the pollinia. Instead of the typical structure where we see a stamen with a filament and anther, kind of like hair-like and stalk-like around the center of the flower. So we have all these structures stuck together in our orchids. There are a bunch of orchids in Minnesota, which may come as a surprise to you. If you want to go do some plant tourism, I pulled out maps of where you might be able to find some different types. So take a look at which of these you think are prettiest and, and you can go find them. Um, some of them are endangered. Please do not pick endangered plants. Go look at them, they're pretty. We're next gonna step into the melanin. So here we're gonna see reduced flowers. We're gonna see a lot of bracts forming around our inflorescences. So a bract, remember, is just anytime we have a modified leaf that looks kind of different. And we're going to see a lot of wind pollination in this group. Uh, so we are going to look a little bit at some groups that look the same, our grasses, our rushes, and our sedges, which all just look like what I would call grass. Um, I'm going to do a little poem for you to remember a little bit about the differences. It's Sedges have edges, rushes are round, and grasses have knees that bend to the ground. I like that little botany poem. Okay. And before I talk about their traits, uh, here we have a little advertisement from the grasses to you. And it's a little threatening, um, but it tells you some stuff. We love fire. Yep. We love fires. Are not like this. We grasses of the world, they not burn this way. Our grassland and savannah fires are smaller, too puny to climb the trees to light their crowns. 
Green grasses look delicate and seemingly insignificant. No strong tree trunks for us. But you would be wise not to underestimate us. Millions of years ago, when we first began to spread, forests covered most of the land. They were our main adversaries, blocking out the sunlight. Have you ever wondered how we, who cannot tolerate shade, even our own shade, can compete with towering trees? Well, we depend on powerful allies. Our first ally is fire. Without fire, we have a problem. The more we grow, the more leaves we make. But the more leaves we make, the more we shade our own new growth. That's where fire comes to our rescue. We offer ourselves to fire. It devours our fuel. Grass and fires aren't hot enough to burn down those giant trees. But they can burn their seedlings, and that makes space for us to multiply. We respout very fast after fire and regrow faster than anyone else. In a healthy, grassy ecosystem, fires burn us every few years. Fire was not our only ally. We offered ourselves up as food to animals, drawing them out of the forest to discover the joys of life, infinite food, and the space to see and flee from predators. While herbivores ate us, they also ate our adversaries and trampled the tender tree saplings. Animals began to multiply and congregate in great herds, preferring our habitat, helping us to spread. Together with the fires and the herd animals, we created a new and marvelous environment with wildflowers such as the world has never seen before. And a great diversity of creatures that love our open habitats. Mammals, birds, reptiles, ants, termites, grasshoppers thriving in the sunlight. Our trees to our celebrities, compatible trees, which follow our rules, letting the light through and able to cope with fire and herbivores. But what of our forest adversaries? Well, over time, we push them back. And they pushed us back. Forest margin trees evolved to protect the forest from our grass and fires. So we began to reach a kind of natural balance. A mosaic of our sunlit world. But now you have plans to plant a trillion trees to offset your carbon footprint. Seemingly unaware of the threat to our ancient grasses. Have you forgotten that we nurtured your ancestors when they began to stand upright to see the view? Without us, there would be no herds of horses, cattle, sheep to feed and clothe you, nor the grains, the cereals that feed your cities. Have you forgotten the diversity of sun-loving life in our open landscapes? Do you realize that our grasslands also store carbon in our soils and reflect more sunlight back into space than forests, helping to cool the earth? Perhaps through understanding, 
to wise stewardship. You will help both grasses and forests to coexist and appreciate the unique environments and the rich ecosystems that both have to offer. So I am not actually anti-planting trees. I do not know where grasses got this weird aggressive PR team, but uh, I find it very funny, number one. Um, but number two, we think about grass often, or we don't think about grass because it's all around us. It's not pretty like flowers, it's not big like trees. So we often ignore it and don't think about what grass and grasslands do for us. They are important parts of ecosystems. They do hold a lot of biomass, especially in the soil, in the roots. Uh, so they are important. <laughs> um, and I guess we can take the point that when we're planting trees, we want to plant them where trees should go. Uh, but that's just a little teaser for our grasses. Okay. I thought I'd let them speak for themselves, oh, but not again. Okay, so our grasses, our true grasses are in the family Poaceae, in the order Poelis. So you can see that up here in this blue group in the camelinids. Uh, there are a lot of genera, a lot of species, uh, 620 plus, although I saw 800 somewhere else, definitely over 10,000 species. And this is a really, really important family because of all the economically important crops that we find here. I'd like this to be big again. Oh, well. Okay. So our grains are going to be included in among our grasses. So rice, wheat, corn. I guess I found wheat really important. I do like bread. Uh, barley, rye are all going to be in this group, as well as some more unexpected things like sugar cane, bamboo, hay, and straw. We do think of those as grasses more often. Uh, some of the plants are going to be grown for paper. Sometimes we grow them for lawns for turf or for erosion control or a sort of environmental purposes. When we're thinking about our grasses, uh, we're going to notice some specialized characteristics or we're going to be using some other terms. So they are often rhizomatous. So we saw rhizomes when we were looking at ferns, for example. So those are these underground structures that are technically modified stems with roots coming off of them. Uh, so when you pull up grass or when I've pulled up crabgrass before as it uh, gets into my garden, right, it can spread very easily by these rhizomes underground. So if you just pick the top part of the grass, just that leaf structure at the top, that's not going to do much for you in the long term. They have these extensive rhizome structures. Uh, the Poaceae, that family, is often going to have hollow stems. Uh, and when we're thinking about grass inflorescences, so they're flowers, they're not necessarily going to look super flowery to us. They are going to be in these little structures called spikelets. So each of these little seed-looking things, right, these little kernel-y things, is actually a floret. So that's a tiny, just slightly boring-looking flower in a spikelet. So nested kind of together in this alternating structure. Um, and that's something we're going to expect to see in our Poaceae. So I've pulled out some pictures and some examples trying to show you some of those characteristics. These I have examples I have pulled from a Minnesota Flowers website that I've also provided the link for. Uh, so that as you're identifying things for your collection, you can go through. Uh, I don't expect you all to become grass experts, but we do want to recognize a couple of the basic characteristics of grasses. 
be able to recognize them and know that they're monocots. Um, we are going to take a look at the rushes and sedges, but really I want you to focus on this Poaceae family, the true glass grasses. But when we say that they have hollow jointed stems, or when that poem says that the grasses have knees, this is what we're looking at, this kind of bent. So this can be characteristic of some of our glasses. We can see this monocot characteristic of having these grasping associations between our stem and our leaf. Uh, and we could actually categorize these more carefully if we were trying to tell apart specific grasses and from specific related groups. So you would see here that in our grasses, those sheaths are often open at the front and sometimes their edges are gonna overlap, but we can see this kind of slit here. Okay. Uh, the leaves will often be in twos, like you can see in our corn. So corn is in this family, the poisier. So you can see those leaves on opposite sides of the stem. So groups of two, this grasping structure with if we pulled one back, we'd see kind of this open slit. When we're looking at the flowers, we've pulled out a florex here. The flowers are usually perfect, so they have both male and female parts, and they have these little two bracts around them, wrapped in a bracts or scale. There would usually be one seed or grain per flower. When we're thinking about bracts, I went down in the fridge, but I, I didn't bring it up here. You can think about like the leaves on corn right, the stuff that you have to shuck off as you're taking corn, that's a good example of a bract. So here are just some more pictures of grasses here, pulled out that same text. So we can see that association of the leaf, the node with this kind of joint here, this kind of knee. You can see that we have opposite sided leaves here. There are other things that look like grasses. So specifically our sedges and our rushes. So we can see that they're technically in a different family. So they are in the same order. So they're in this group Poale, but they're not in the Poaceae specifically. Uh, so if you are looking something up for your collection and it looks like grass to you, but you really can't find it, these are good groups to check through. So when you're looking at the rushes, the Juncaceae family, you're gonna see that the stems are more rounded. Uh, or potentially compressed kind of in a cross section. They're not usually going to be hollow. You're not gonna see the same sort of knee-like joint structure. Uh, you're gonna see fewer leaves on the whole. You're going to see still sheaths open in front, but they may have these little extra bits called oracles. Flowers are still gonna be perfect, uh, but they look a little different here. You can see the flower of a rush, and you can see that the capsules are looking kind of different than they do in the grasses, multi-seeded. So here's a drawing of what a rush might look like for comparison to those grasses. So you can see that rounder stem, we don't have knobbly knees, um, kind of more rounded looking leaf. The sedges, sedges are gonna have either round stems like the rushes or kind of three-sided stems, so kind of more angled. The sheaths aren't going to have a slit. They're going to have a kind of closure around them. So you can see this a sort of filmy closed sheath in the front. Uh, the leaves will often be in groups of three, so kind of in columns if you're looking at a sedge from the side. Flowers are going to be more varied. So some of them will be male, some of them will be female. Some flowers will be perfect, depending on what sedge you're looking at. They look kind of like this. So here we can actually see the male parts and the female parts of this inflorescence kind of stacked on top of each other. Uh, and the seeds are going to be in dry fruit called sheens. So here we can see an example of a sedge. Okay. But in this larger order, the poales, uh, we don't have just the grasses. So a lot of things in there look like grasses. We have those grasses, we got the rushes, we got the sedges, uh, but things like pineapple are also in this group. So when you're looking at this larger group, you may also be looking at a plant that has leaves coming back in kind of a rosette, so kind of a rose-like structure. Uh, pineapples are part of the bromeliad family, uh, which 
the little air plants I was passing around, I think are also in this same family. So they catch water kind of in between the leaves here and store them. They can form cool little mini ecosystems. So bromeliads, in addition to having pineapples that we can have for fruit, I have a lot of little epiphytes that create important ecosystems in the nooks and crannies of trees and like tropical forests. They're kind of my favorite. Okay, so the rest of the slides are kind of identification resources. So here we have a link to grasses, sedges, and rushes, some YouTube videos about grass. We have a sort of simple key where you can click through uh, as you're trying to identify things going through, telling you key characteristics that you might be looking for. Um, more grass ID, we got a table here. And the final thing I wanna go through is just the plant collection instructions. Did you guys see that this went up over the weekend? Hopefully, okay. Um, so what you're looking for as your end product, we have Our nice herbarium paper. So those pressed plants that we've been looking at in our lab as part of our herbarium, you're basically going to be trying to make those. Uh, so once you have a flat dry plant, you're going to glue it on to the paper like this. And I have some herbarium glue for us here. So once you have plants dry, you can kind of make that. You are going to be labeling. You are going to be labeling each plant with some information. So you've seen those little cards that we have on each of our plants in our herbarium. Look. Like this. So I also have stacks of those for you, or you can print out this little table that I have put in our instructions. So you're going to give the scientific name of each plant, common name if there is one, the family it's in. So the family like coaceae, the grasses, for example, if you happen to go find a wild corn plant and press it. You're gonna give the location that you found it. You're gonna put your name and you're gonna put your date. So we have little cards for those. I can set them up, I'll leave these here as well. Once you got 10 plants, you are going to create a dichotomous key for just your collection of 10 specimens specifically. So we have examples of the dichotomous keys in like those books that we've been using in lab. I also linked, do, do, do. They're like, actually, I think I just put it in here. Okay. So if you want an explainer about how you might build a dichotomous key, you can find that in the instructions here. If you feel good on dichotomous keys, you can just make one, um, but this shows you kind of a process for it. Uh, for identifying the plants, I've popped some links in here. I will add more as I find things that might be useful. So the DNR, and this Minnesota Flowers website are good places to look for things that we might be finding around our area specifically. Um, and I've sent you to the spring ephemerals section of this power or whatever, this PDF specifically, because those should be the things that come up first. Okay. So the things that are gonna be popping up soon will be things like this. Another general kind of process for identifying plants, what I kind of like to do is, I'm not anti-technology, right? So often I will use an app first to get an idea of what AI thinks my plant might be. Don't stop there though. Once you have some possible plant identifications, that's the point at which you want to like, look up on Wikipedia or on some other source, a description of the plant and compare it and like think critically about whether that's possibly what you're actually looking at. So if it describes some completely different type of leaf when you look up a description, even if the app said that it's some plant, like, you'll know you gotta go try again. 
um, but that can get you sort of in the region. And I'm adding guides to the Minnesota tree guides I got there. Uh, found a guy who mosses if you want to moss. I'll also be placing some examples of things to look for up here. So here we have some example twigs. All the twigs you're gonna find around here, but if you want to give me a twig, I got those there. Instead of bothering to glue down twigs to paper, what I'd like you to do is just cut a piece of thread, tie it around, and attach your little stuff like that way. So got the thread for you there. Uh, do we have further questions? I guess I can show you how to use this. But it's just taking sandwich with our cardboard, um, blotting paper, and um, newspaper. So all this stuff on the side is going to get you have a bunch of old newspapers that you're planning to toss. I don't know if anybody reads the newspaper anymore, but just stack them there for your classmates to use. So this is my plant, this is a full rag. I'm gonna fold it into some newspaper. I'll lay it out flat. So I might use two faces. I might just spread it on how large it is. You'll put blotting paper on either side. So this is this weird kind of textured, absorbent feeling paper. On, on either side like that. And then we're gonna stack even more. So we're gonna make a cardboard sandwich on either side. And then we will put it within our plant press. Take some of the grass felt that we found in this box if we need more of those to tighten things well. Here's what they are. So could use one, usually we use two, one on either side. We just tighten it up and then only it sitting for a while. You put it on like a radiator or a vent. If you kind of sand it on its edge, it will dry a little quicker as the air flows past. But this is basically all you're doing. If you don't feel like you can get it tight enough or you realize that you don't actually have boards at home, you can do the same sort of sandwich structure and then just pile a bunch of heavy stuff on top of it, like books, plants. The point is just to get it really dry and really flat. Any questions? Okay, cool. And I also have the just like how the points are going to be assigned here, right? So we want 10 different things. They should be in different families. I can't imagine that that will be a problem. Want you to get those identifications. You actually put the ID cards on it and the collection is not a total gross mess and you have a dichotomous key and the dichotomous key actually makes sense and gets you to the plant identification. Okay. And as you have questions, if you find things that you're confused about as you actually try to do this, we'll have time for lunch. All right. And that's it for today, unless you have any questions.